Ladies and gentlemen, our, our next speaker uh, is Ian Stewart, the uh, Head of Channel and Acquisitions at the telecommunications company Arkiva. Uh, he's here to give his take on the Internet of Things. Would you give him a very warm welcome, please? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm stood between you and lunch. So I'm going to try and keep the momentum going that Jeremy built up for us there. Um, I'm going to come on to who our Kiva is a little bit later because I'm very conscious that many in the audience may not be aware of that. So we'll touch on that in a minute. But really what I wanted to do is to get you to think about um, a specific set of conditions and opportunities within the Internet of Things and how... Um, through a very specific type of uh, connectivity, low-powered, wide-area connectivity, that um, we can unlock the promise of the, of the Internet of Things. Hopefully, that will become clear as we, as we go through. We've heard um, from a number of speakers, and, and Jeremy touched on a lot of this, um, of the momentum and scale that's building up around the Internet of Things. Many of you, um, presumably why most of you are sat here, are either involved in this or have read lots about it. Um, and the industry has a huge amount of hype behind this. Um, lots and lots of different views as to the size and the scale of it, anything from seven, nine, up to the, the magical 50 billion or even 1.3 trillion, I think it is the latest, um, by this magical 2020. Um, I guess the, the, the key thing is the opportunity is huge. It almost doesn't perhaps matter exactly how huge. These numbers are just so phenomenal. Um, I think the key thing to, to grasp is that things are becoming intelligent. Um, but perhaps the most important part behind all of this is the fact that the volume and the value of data that's been created is actually being adopted and, and becoming a driver, a critical driver, of, of business um, transformation and business di disruption. Um, there are already today uh, more connected devices than there are people. Um, in in some, of the, you know, some of the reports that are out in the market, they, they talk about that um, there is only something in the region of 1% of the things that exist in the world connected today. Uh, Jeremy had some more salacious figures than I've got here about the, uh, the, the, the amount of data. And the challenge with this is that this, the amount of data is, is just changing constantly, but the numbers are phenomenal. Um, you know, but certainly, there's, uh, it's fairly accepted that the vast majority of data that's created today has been created in the last, last two years. Um, in terms of uh, a little bit further down the line, by 2020, um, and for, for me, with where, where I'm going to talk to you today about, it's somewhere in the region of 40% of that data uh, in 2020 will come from connected sensors. And I think that's really, as well as the, uh, some of the more consumer-centric opportunities and the, the, the digital services opportunities that we've discussed so far this morning, which are, are huge and real and, and very powerful in the industry, we should also think about, um, perhaps uh, at a technology level, it's, 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 not, it's sometimes seen as not quite as, as sexy, but um, those, those sensors that are actually enabling uh, inanimate objects uh, to ultimately talk to each other, create valuable information, create new services, that's really the powerhouse of um, creating the Internet of Things uh, and the ability to transform the industries that we all operate in today. Um, so it really is, we've, we've touched on it before, but it really is about the, uh, regardless of which analysts' views you choose to, to listen to, and there are many, many credible ones, but ultimately um, it's all about the proof is in the data, um, and it, it certainly is real. The Internet of Things is, is not new. Um, it could be many in the audience have been involved in uh, machine to machine or M to M for, for, for many years. Um, and certainly there are organizations that are, are um, building a very large, profitable um, businesses and, and, and valuable services around M2M. I think the big thing, again, that's transformed um, that and taken this, that whole industry to a new level that we're all now as an industry talking about as the Internet of Things is this, um, this, this, this ability for these things to actually talk to one another. Um, and ultimately, to you know, if you actually take a step back from the amazing solutions, and we've, seen, we've heard of many of those uh, earlier on today, the absolutely incredible technology. I mean, you saw from my first computer was also a VIC-20. Um, you know, if you see, you think just in a short period of time how technology has transformed, um, and, and these truly epic volumes of data that have been created. At the heart of all of this movement is information. It's about creation of information services. Um, and ultimately, it's about the, in, that information enabling more efficient, more compelling, um, and more valuable um, products and services. It's actually enabling 
um, both revolutions in consumer and business. And if you think about consumer sections, um, we've really seen a, a, a digital enhancement of, of products and services. Um, I, like a few people that are talking today, talked at many of these different events. And I, I always sort of, always makes me chuckle a bit with a Fitbit piece, because um, I sort of have to hold my hand up to being now, I guess, technically middle-aged, even though I'm in, in gross denial. Um, I've got a cupboard of Fitbits, um, being a complete gadget freak. And uh, my wife has curtailed my gadget budget, um, because I do what a lot of people did or used to do. Um, and truly amazing technologies that a whole host of companies have, are, are, are driving this sector with. But how many people in the room, or people you know, have bought these sort of uh, gadgets and technologies, and you wear them, you proudly show them around your friends and around the office, and as part of uh, trying to get amazingly fit, and then you decide that actually you weren't that really committed to getting fit, and you prefer the extra uh, a little bit of uh, chocolate bars and all the rest of it. Um, that was certainly me. And it's interesting that these, the digital, the real digital enhancements of um, sectors, and where Fitbits, the successful bit, Fitbit type products, are coming to the fore are where the, um, the, the, the sensor technology and the connectors are actually um, being driven by curated digital services. Um, it's actually going beyond just the technology, using the information, using the services to encourage you, whether that's to have a sort of personal trainer type piece. So that's my next uh, ambition, to find, find a Fitbit with a curated service that uh, convinces me to stay on my, my fitness regime. There's also, if you look at, uh, look at businesses, um, the Internet of Things has huge potential to turbocharge organizations. Um, M2M is, is at the heart of, of, of that charge historically, where we've got connectivity in different forms embedded, where at the very simple end on monitoring performance, but actually the ability for um, the, 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 the next evolution of M2M, and especially with low-cost sensors, uh, is to actually really turbocharge and disrupt uh, different sort of industries. Um, the the Internet of Things um, has many challenges, whether that is from, uh, you know, how do we actually um, address the security concerns, uh, how do we address the um, specifications and standards of the different things. But I just wanted to highlight one particular challenge, really, which is, you know, the industry is getting very, very excited about this magical 50-plus billion opportunities. And it's undoubtedly real. There's no question of that. Um, I think the challenge that, that perhaps too many have forgotten about, or, or not, perhaps not thinking enough about, is how are we actually going to create an infrastructure of things, and how are we actually going to create uh, connectivity and business models that scale to support this kind of number? You know, if you think about it, stop for a minute and think about 50 billion things. That actually requires um, many, many things, tens, hundreds of things per person uh, in the world. Phenomenal numbers. The connectivity, the technology, the business models that we actually use today can't sustain that kind of growth. So there's huge opportunity in there. But actually, we've heard a lot about people needing to, to innovate, uh, to fail fast, learn, fail fast, fail cheaply as well, and move on and adopt these different uh, approaches and different business models. And I, I, there's some, some interesting reports. I actually um, read a fantastic um, article from a guy called Nick Hun and uh, Wireless Connectivity last year. And he, he, pulled out some of these facts, which I thought were really pertinent to what is behind the, this, this growth. You know, and he talks to the, the first 25 billion of these connected things and the Internet of Things coming from personal products. So we're already we're into that. We've seen fan, some fantastic examples around mobile phones, laptops, tablets, um, you know, Apple Watches, uh, Google, Google uh, Fitbits, and so on. Uh, phenomenal growth. We're seeing in the historic M2M business the momentum gaining in M2M <coughs> really being quite, quite epic. The second wave coming from um, locally connected products, and this is where there's some huge opportunities for either um, products and solutions that were perhaps connected to mobile phones and tablets, but also the, uh, the, the hundreds of millions of things which are not connected, have never had a voice, being able to be connected to one another and actually creating brand new digital, digital economies. Um, but ultimately, this scale will only happen um, if we actually have an appropriate connectivity model uh, and business models across these different industries. So we talk about really the need of this, this idea of this infrastructure of things um, and the fact to create uh, for real growth beyond going beyond the sort of um, fantastic technologies we have today or have had around needing this idea to create automagic products. And if you think about the, um, the challenges that some of you may not have, you may be all fantastic technologists in the room, but 
I'd lay bet that you have plenty of people you know at home or at work that struggle with mobile phones. They struggle with connecting a Bluetooth headset. Um, take that into some of the other um, business environments and you know, think then about the sheer scale of the, of the things, the physical objects we're talking about here. Um, the the uh, models to economically enable those services and roll those services out cannot rely on objects being set up in every instance by professionals. Now, I'm not saying for a minute that that need goes away. There are clearly many, many um, products and solutions that will continue to need um, different types of connectivity and technology. Um, but to get real scale and for the, the, the true Internet of Things, if you like, or the, the scale of it, we need low-powered um, sensors that are low cost that actually just work automatically. So, you know, you just you, you take it out of the box, you switch it on, you stick it on a surface, and it's working. It doesn't connect to a phone or, or a, a gateway. It's actually connecting off to the network on a base station. Um, it's then the real value comes in in terms of taking the data, turning it information, uh, and there's, there's a whole host of other digital opportunities um, that, that get created from that. But it's, those are some of the challenges that um, we at Archiva are keen for people to think about um, for us driving the sheer scale of this. And there are, are many flavors. I'm not suggesting this is just one by any means. So a little bit about Archiva, for those who, who perhaps don't know. Archiva is a uh, communications and infrastructure uh, a media services organization. Um, we are, uh, as a company, at the heart of the UK's um, broadcast, uh, mobile, uh, Wi-Fi, and satellite business uh, or, or markets. Um, just some of the key stats. Um, so if you're watching any of this uh, on, on, uh, on Wi-Fi uh, around the areas, chances are you're watching that across um, a good chunk of Archiva's Wi-Fi technology. Um, for those of you who go home and uh, watch any of the TV, um, it's all coming from, uh, from Archiva. Um, we've moved in just some of the stats here. Some of the, I won't read them out, but you know, sort of uh, some, some major amounts of volume of data that we as a company um, build infrastructure, manage infrastructure to deploy critical um, infrastructure services for, um, I guess, UK PLC. Um, and the company has, has also uh, moved um, into different types of low-powered wide area networks for um, fairly, uh, to, to many, certainly when we sort of comparing against fantastically sexy products like iPhones and tablets and such that most people would, would perhaps not think about. But um, I, I've recently joined Archiva from, from O2. So both those two companies in the, in the UK are, are front and center of the um, UK uh, government's smart grid, so putting smart meters into our homes and buildings to drive energy efficiency. Um, we've also, as a company, Archiva, heavily involved in using similar technologies to um, drive uh, new digital services across the uh, utilities, power and water industry in terms of uh, metering. So we see this, uh, I'll move into the Internet of Things and M2M um, technologies as a, as a natural evolution of that. Um, and to do that, we've actually built um, a dedicated uh, network for the Internet of Things um, based on Sigfox uh, technology. Um, Sigfox technology is a, a new technology rolling out globally in different countries. Um, Archiva has the, um, is the, uh, the, the lead in terms of building that network out in the UK. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a low-power, low-bandwidth, um, wide-area technology. So it's, a, it's based on the 868 um, bandwidth, which I'm... Um, before lunch, I'm not going to start going into any more details on that. I'm, I'm here for two days. When we want to talk about it, we can, I'm more than happy to go into more detail. But the key thing is that this is all about very, very low-powered sensors, um, sort of sensors that can sit out and can be battery-operated and can have a battery life for 10-plus years, can sit out within any form of system, could sit on a, an object. You know, For an organization like we're in today, imagine where they, they need to know where um, objects that are moving, moving around. You can have a simply bat, sim, uh, sensor that's stuck onto a surface. All of a sudden, you, you can actually you know where your assets are. It's that kind of ability. The range is anywhere, depending on the topology, sort of 15 to 20 kilometers radius from a, from a base station. So it's very low cost, very low power, very wide area. Um, we've already started rollout. We're, we're in um, 10, actually 11 cities, um, and, and starting to build uh, towards a full national um, network. Um, whilst this network of, of, of um, low-powered sensors that work automatically, um, you know, there are, there are a huge number of 
opportunities to, to really, or requirements, I should say, to really drive the, the volume uptake of that. So these, you know, these um, sensors will have to be, uh, you know, as well as low cost, will need to be pre-provisioned out of the box. Um, they actually need to have a very, very flexible servicing model. And we're already used to, in the consumer space, um, you know, models where bits of hardware, products, have, are data enabled for their life. Uh, you know, if you think of um, the evolution that we saw maybe is 10 years ago now, eight or 10 years ago now, with BlackBerry and wireless email, and how we probably, a safe bet, pretty much everybody's probably got wireless email in one form or another in their pockets right now on their phones. We look at what uh, Kindle and Amazon have done in terms of literature with um, fully loaded price on a, on a Kindle. So it's very similar sort of thinking to that in terms of um, these very low cost sensors that are pre-provisioned to work out of the box with connectivity built into them for, for the life of that object. Security, uh, you know, as, um, as has been mentioned, hugely important factor. It's as much about, I think, uh, building up the trust in the partnerships of organizations that are delivering that security. Um, but with this being um, uh, narrow band wireless technology, it is inherently more secure. It's harder to jam um, because of the, the way it frequency hops uh, and so on. Um, and also, this is interesting that um, if you look at uh, traditional GSM um, areas of Internet of Things, um, then uh, real-time computing power at the edge of the network and real-time decision-making for certain applications is absolutely critical to drive the value of the smart system. But that needn't be the case in all, in all objects. And actually, in, case, in the case of the majority of objects that are out there, you don't need real-time. It's a quasi-real-time. So I just need to know that something is... Um, switched on, it's switched off, it's been moved, it's empty, it needs filling. Um, there's something that's moved too close to it. These are the sorts of very, very simple commands that can actually create um, uh, information, value, and the ability to create new service models um, of all sorts of different objects. Um, when we talk about low costs, we're talking about objects here that um, are, are in the you know, couple of pounds a year to, uh, when we're at volume, um, to, to power for a lifetime. Uh, and the sensors themselves are down at, you know, sort of maybe 10 pounds or something of that region. So we're looking at, uh, in, a, in a roundabout term, something that's around about a fifth of the cost of a traditional uh, connected Internet of Things sensor technology that you'd have today based on GSM. Now, that's a very, very generic statement. There are different horses for courses. But just to give you a, a bit of a flavor that when we're saying low cost, what, what I'm meaning. In terms of low data rates as well, um, this really is, is not about um, volume of, of data and speed of data. Yes, it is in certain applications. But in this context, in terms of enabling the majority of the, the objects that will make up this 50 billion, it's actually more about very, very low data rates, tiny packets. And the, the Sigfox network works on a different model. So when we're actually working with partners and customers, we're not selling them megabytes and gigabytes of, of data in the traditional models. We're actually selling them small packets of message data. So the Sigfox technology works and sends um, up to a maximum of 140 messages per day per sensor. Um, and each of those messages are only 12 bytes. That's absolutely tiny. And it's because of that that we have an incredibly efficient um, ability to transport that data hence the very low power, hence why we can have sensors that can sit there for 10 years with a battery and never need anything doing with them. They're constantly enabling services and revenue. Clearly, that, those numbers will change depending on the frequency of messages you're sending up and down. But the, the technology is quite different from traditional radio in that it's probably more than a broadcast. You know, if you're sitting, sitting there and something had a GSM radio in there, it would be transmitting and then it would be sitting there listening the whole time, just as your mobile phones are now in your pockets. But think of the, the low-powered networks as more of a chirping technology. So the sensors will sit there, and they will send their command, and they go straight back to sleep. And there's, a, there's a, a, an ability to, for it to come back on if, if you direct it, so it can listen for a command coming back to tell it to do something else or change a parameter. So it's a different model, a different mindset, but it's the, the combination of um, power usage um, that drives incredibly low cost and the ability for these objects um, to be battery powered, which is really going to be the bulk of um, driving the, uh, the, this, this new volume. Um, I've heard discussions already about data, big data, huge topic. Um, you could do an entire two days just on this, but think about it. It's not really about big data. It's really about small data is what it's about. Um, 
and it's not, it really isn't the size of your data that matters. It's actually taking those just the really tiny little bits. I'm not saying for a minute that this will replace some of the, the, uh, the, the greater bandwidth applications that clearly are out there, but this is for a diff completely different set of um, applications and uses where tiny, tiny amounts of data about whether, as I said before, whether something's full or moved or hasn't moved or if something's been moved uh, too close to an object, tiny amounts of data, efficient use, and it's all around, around making sense of that and actually reporting the right things at the right time in the right way. And it's through that that we, we can really start driving um, the smart systems for the, for the mass of these things that are, that are actually out there. The Internet of Things as, we've, as we are today is, is polarized. Um, and we have at one, end, one scale of the market these truly huge programs such as the Smart Grid. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, we have a, a whole host of, albeit very high value, but smaller niche um, data-centric or, or digital-centric products. The real volume opportunity for this is taking technologies such as low-powered wide area networks with very, very cheap low-powered sensors and actually enabling uh, almost a retrofit approach, enabling the, the existing systems that are out there and making them smart, creating money from the things that are already, already out there. Um, and we're seeing a lot of companies starting to realize this and spending a significant amount of resource developing solutions. Um, partly for creating either more efficient or innovative solutions and services for themselves or for, them cust for their customers. But there's also a um, fac fascinating debate which is going on at the industry level, um, which again is you create these networks or these environments with data, um, and it might be that 80% of the data that the things in your ecosystem create, you don't actually need. But somebody else could have huge huge value, would put huge value towards those things. So the, the digital economy created um, from these sorts of networks, there's a definite core for a specific organization to create new services or efficiencies, but there's a far greater opportunity for looking at brokering that data. Yes, there are lots of debates and challenges around um, personal data and privacy and security, but there's a massive opportunity there to be had. So it's not just about just the actual objects or the things themselves. Um, if you look at the car industry, for example, which you know, we've seen, if you look at the, where is, what, what's driving the, uh, innovative, the, the um, uh, Internet of Things, you've got um, digital home, connected car, you've got smart city, you've got wearables, and then you've got the industrial internet. Those are the five big pillars, really, that you could distill everything down into. Um, and actually, the amount of systems that are out there that are existing, that companies, if you can actually show that you can enable smart enable and revolutionize existing systems, that's going to be a way of creating um, significant revenue and growth uh, rather than just looking at complete redesign from the bottom up. And that's really what low-powered uh, wide area networks uh, deliver. Um, some of the examples, just to, I'm not going to, in time, I'm not going to go through all of these, but one example I wanted to give in terms of um, social, social and, and home care. We actually um, put a proof of concept together, but it was just an example of how uh, of the, of the power of this sort of technology. There was a report recently that um, UK government put out, and it was um, a set of stats as to the um, amount of increased deaths that happen um, as a result of fuel poor um, in the times when it gets very cold. And then relating that back to the much bigger challenges of social care and the health industry around how to support people um, and, and making them well or keeping them well in, in their homes as opposed to in, uh, in, in medical facilities. As a general rule, um, especially if we're looking specifically in this context, um, the elderly, as a general rule, it's, it's getting on sort of from the, the, the bits and pieces that I found on the web, um, 28, 30,000 pounds a head to keep somebody in a, um, some, some form of um, care home as opposed to 11 or 12,000, again, give or take, in their home. So obviously to the uh, to the health industry, to the, uh, you know, to, the, to the communities, huge value in keeping people there. The next challenge you've got is then around fuel, pure, fuel poor. So we actually had a, a very simple sensor, um, which was about so big, a couple of inches tall, that literally um, just stuck on um, somebody's, in their, somebody's living room. Um, the battery, the, the sensor itself was around about 10 pounds. Connectivity costs about two pounds a year. So you've got a solution which is 10 or 12 pounds a year, doesn't need any specialist fitting, just sticks on a wall or a surface, and once a day, it sends a temperature reading out. Now, that could actually be 
if you chose, to go off into a, a, into a very complex data analytics system uh, um, if you wanted to add it and maybe mash it up with other, other data in terms of perhaps care, care um, uh, frequency and, and um, quality of service and so on with other sensors. But it could also just be a very simple, um, and the, the, one of the other benefits of the Sigfox technology is a very simple API set. So this literally just sends out a temperature reading with 12 bytes of information a day using his battery sensor, um, pops out to the cloud. That could actually then go back to the doctor's surgery as an email. It could go off to your, it, you know, it could be that it's, you've put this sensor in and it's your, your granny sensor, so it comes home to your email account. A whole host of different opportunities of taking um, this, this smart data from um, huge industrial corporate scale right the way down to personal scale, but ultimately with a very, very cheap sensor that, that lives there for 10 plus years is actually providing additional information that otherwise you would have had to physically send somebody out and measure the temperature or rely on somebody being able to, to monitor the temperature in the homes themselves. And there are many, many examples, but it was meant to be just a very, you know, very, very simple one. So just to, to, to close, because I think we're running out of time, um, you know, our approach has been to, um, to try and kickstart this market. So the Archiva have invested um, heavily in starting the, the network rollout. Um, uh, and a major part of that was to, there are, there are competing, those in the room that are involved in the space will know, there are competing wireless technology, low-powered wireless technologies. Sigvox is perhaps at the moment one of the more advanced in terms of being ready at a, an industrial scale. Um, we've been working um, for quite a while now to roll out the network and also work with a whole so host of organizations to get solutions from silicon right the way through to uh, end digital solutions to start driving um, opportunities. Um, and we spent a lot of time um, building up a, a partner ecosystem. Um, and our keen, which is one of the reasons I'm here, was, is really just to get people to come and talk to us about um, the opportunities, how we can actually um, help you and work with you to help create um, powerful new IoT solutions that are um, enabling um, objects, systems, and opportunities that to date have not been possible. I think we'll leave it there, otherwise I'll get killed in a rush for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>